so this we're finally getting into actual the topic of the book linear regression i gotta say this is something i like about this book i mean every other book i mean this is not my first time doing linear regression certainly not your either one of your first time is doing linear regression but it's really interesting to take this like slow, steady, detailed look at it and really think about what you're doing, because so often I think um, you just learn it like in a chapter or two in amongst a bunch of other stuff and then you move on and you're like, oh, yeah, linear regression is so simple and trivial. I hardly ever use it. I was going to use, you know, uh, neural networks or I'm going to use XG booster. I'm going to use whatever your favorite poison is. And um, it's really, it's, I think it's really cool to take this kind of deep dive into linear regression. And so now we're doing the really <laughs> the simplest possible case, right? This chapter is pretty short. Linear regression of a single predictor. It's something that we're familiar with, I'm sure. But um, you guys can see my my uh, chapter. The uh, is it big enough? The text. I need to make it bigger somehow. Yes. Okay, that's good. So. We're doing the simplest possible case here. We want to learn, we want to look at linear regression with uh, a single predictor. This is the standard, right? Um, y sub i here for your outcome is equal to some intercept plus some slope times your predictor. And then there's some error term that's identically in, and independently distributed usually, right? The assumption. So we're going to demonstrate the steps of fitting, plotting, and interpreting the fit. We're going to learn this is kind of the cool part here, learn to check this procedure using fake data simulation. And in this chapter, this is kind of almost trivial, but I would argue that even in doing linear regression, you should do this kind of fake data simulation because it's so easy to, to make a mistake somewhere, even if you think you've done it a million times and, and so okay, it's very I'm useful. Oh, go ahead, Abba. Sorry, um, go ahead. You, you didn't change your screen, right? You're just, you, you, yeah. Yeah, I'm still here on this screen. I'm no, I'm saying you didn't change your screen. No, right. no, I did not. You should see this, right? Learning, yeah. Yes. And so, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of. I'm talking ahead a little bit of what uh, uh, I'm going to probably repeat myself, but that's okay. And then finally, we're going to look at uh, how linear regression also includes the ideas of these simple comparisons, kind of like A B comparison type things that we did talk about in previous chapters. So for uh, e example data, the book uses uh, one set of data. I decided I would just for fun, I would try drag in some other set of data to look at. Uh, I found this uh, nutritional data set on Kaggle that looks at obesity or overweight uh, and all kinds of, uh, for me, state, like what percentage of this state is obese, what percentage of the state is overweight, and, are, and then what percentage is engages in different physical activity, what, you know, some kinds of nutritional data, there's a ton of stuff in there. I just extracted out two variables for one year <laughs> to try to make it small and, and more simple. And so it wouldn't overload the server when I push this onto GitHub. And so I chose the uh, percentage of the state, which is have obesity and the percentage who engage in strength training at least twice a week to see if there's some um, relationship between those two variables, right? And so in R, I just read that in. It's a, it's in, it's going to be on the GitHub, or you can go to CAG and get it directly. But the data is going to be the GitHub. And the first few rows look like this: just every state, like Alabama, 35% obesity. And I don't know how they got. I didn't really. You know, it doesn't really matter for me because I'm not going to use this to make any predictions or do anything real. But so I didn't look to see, oh, what, how did they measure this? Did they, you know, ask people or did they, is this some kind of health survey that they did um, from doctor's offices or what? But uh, and, and people probably lie about how much strength training they do, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this is, we're just going to take this as data as handed to us and we're going to analyze it. So, like I was saying, in Alabama, 35% or obese or obese and 25%. 0.7% engage in strength training at least twice a week. So the first step, and this is exactly what the book does, we just do a little plot. I'm going to, all, all the R code will be on the repo when I uh, do the pull request, which I remember I got to do that. Uh, but this is like the scatter plot for it. I hid the R code that generates this, but it's pretty straightforward. Here's all the states. And you can see there does seem to be a really negative relationship between the amount of strength training that's done in that state versus the amount of the percentage of obesity. It's not saying that one of these necessarily predicts the other, but they at least have some kind of relationship. 
it certainly is believable that one might predict the other, but um, that's that's the data we're going to use. So in the spirit of the same thing the book did, we're going to use Stan GLM and just say, okay, uh, this is how you do it with Stan GLM. You just use this formula syntax, obesity, uh, regression on strength training. Data is that exercise data I just had. Um, this is something I found out about, which I pass on to you as <laughs> some wisdom for using Stan GLM. You put refresh equal to zero, it will not spit out all the chain diagnostics. Now you probably want to look at the chain diagnostics, but when you're doing a presentation like this, you don't want them all in your cluttering up things. So you can just suppress that by putting refresh equal to zero. And it won't spit out all the chain one, chain two, chain three. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's neat. So that's how you can do that. And a similar thing, when you do the print the fit, if you put detail equal to false, you only will get the results of the parameters, not all, a bunch of other diagnostic stuff too that you should look at, but for purposes here, we're not gonna look at, right? We're just taking this as a, in this chapter, uh, we're just taking this as a kind of a black box process. Um, we're not worried about any, what's going on behind the scenes. We just called Stan GLM and it spits out the fit parameters. The intercept, which would be A in this case is 61.8, which the interpretation could be that if there was no strength training, that the obesity would be 61.8, but that's a bit of an extrapolation, of course. And it has a, a standard deviation, or I guess I should say the um, median uh, average deviation scaled to be a standard deviation of 3.8. And the slope is negative, like I like we saw from the plot, minus 1.1, and the standard deviation or MADSD is 0 0.1. So that means that we're concentrating on the slope part it does mean that this is a significant um, slope, right? We, it's unlikely that we get a value that large uh, by just chance data that what didn't have some kind of relationship. And finally, the last thing that comes out of the fit is this, uh, the size of the noise term, right? So it says that if for given prediction, uh, we also, we could expect an additional random factor of, uh, with a standard deviation of 2.5, right? And we know that parameter only as good as 0.2 itself, right? So this, this is the standard error on our estimate of the noise term in the fit. So the book says in chapter eight, uh, which is the next chapter, we'll go into the actual more what's going on with this fitting procedure. But in this chapter, we're going to say, okay, just given, this is given to us, what can we learn from this? I, I actually, I'll probably talk through almost all of the things on the next thing already, right? So here's that fit line. Um, here's the fit as an equation, right? So what we learned, well, we found the fit, fitted line is 61.9 minus 1.1 X, right? Ignoring the errors for the moment. And this, like I said, well, I didn't say this, but like you can see that means that for every one percentage increase in the percentage of people that do strength training in a state, we see a corresponding decrease in obesity by about 1% as well, 1.1. It's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship as far as that goes, but there is some noise on that, right? Uh, both on the uh, intercept and the slope, we talked about that. The 95% interval for the slope is from minus, assuming a normal distribution, is minus 0.9 to 1.3. So it's well separated from zero. That's what we learned there too. So that is a significant effect. And the, as I said already, the residual standard deviation is 2.5. So when we predict something for this model, the, the prediction is only good to two and a half percentage points uh, standard deviation, right? 60% range. So this is all stuff you know, but this is just a quick review, I guess, right? And then we can use that model to make a prediction if we wanted to. And this is sort of far-fetched because I'm not sure there's only, you know, we only have this one. We can't predict a new state. So I just made up this idea. Well, suppose some state engages in a program to promote strength training and manages over like several years to get a successful, to successfully get a 32% participation rate in the state. Um, with this model, what would we predict for the obesity percentage or obesity rate in that state? Well, we just plug it into our linear model and we get 26.7%. Uh, obesity, right? And again, there's an air two and a half percent uncertainty in that from our model. So that would give us a 95% confidence interval from 21.7 to 31.7 percent, right? Something like 22 to 32 percent range prediction. And this only uses the uncertainty in the um, the noise term, but as a text, as it, as it says in the book, where we will learn in chapter nine that we how to include also the uncertainties in the fitted parameters themselves, which will increase that 
uh, confidence interval a bit. The point being that, you know, there's other slopes that are consistent with the data, there's other intercepts that are consistent with the data, and we should incorporate that into our prediction uncertainty as well. Does that make sense? That's all. Mm -hmm. Let's see, where were we? So the next part of the book talks about fake data, and I love fake data, <laughs> it's great stuff. So the idea is you assume, you create this pretend world where this is the actual facts, where y equals 61.9 minus 1.1 times x plus some error term, and we assume the error is normally distributed now. Uh, we didn't, you know, at the, the standard deviation of 2.5 percentage points, 2.5 mm -hmm. percentage points in obesity, as it were. So we just put this in, into R, right? All those variables I said. Uh, we're going to use the same predictors, the same strength training predictors, uh, predictors, right? But now we're going to simulate the obesity as a fake measurement by just putting in the equation for the line and adding some noise, right? So this is very straightforward, right? And it's important that I think it's important that it is straightforward. When you the, the point of fake data to me is you do something that's blindingly obviously straightforward, okay, right? And you're just doing this so that you can check all your procedures work. And that way you can, it should work. And better, even that should be blindly obvious. There's no reason why this shouldn't work. But if it doesn't work, you know somewhere you had an assumption you just didn't even, you didn't even know you had, right? Yeah. And so again, we're going to fit the data using stand GLM, right? Same as we did before. So, so now we're using data equals hey, fake. Peter. Sorry? Are you supposed to get exactly the same because we started with 61.9. Like you use whatever you want. I just happen to use the, the, what we fit to, right? 61.9 is what we fit to. So I'm using this as, I'm assuming this is the real, this is what the, in the pretend world, we're assuming we know the intercept is exactly 61.9. I could have put 62, I could put anything in. And we're assuming we know that the slope is exactly 1.1. All right, that's the truth. Unlike in the real world, we don't know the truth. In the fake world, we do. And that's the advantage of the fake data simulation. So we do the fit, and of course, we don't get exactly back the same intercept, and we because it's noisy, right? The data is noisy because we added the, the the noise to it, the two and a half percentage point noise. And so the intercept is fifty eight point eight that we fit, but it's consistent, right? Because the standard deviation four that's consistent with the sixty one, and the slope that we get is minus one point zero. That's consistent with the minus 1.1 because the standard deviation on the fit parameter is 0.1. So we expect that, right? And in fact, if we were to keep fitting this over and over and over again in a loop, we'd get different answers over and over again, with different medians, different slopes. And that's exactly what we, will, what we should do, is do that in a loop. And that's what this code does, which I'm not going to walk through because it's boring, but <laughs> you're certainly really ready. I mean, you're, uh, you're certainly welcome to look through, but it's basically exactly the same thing that's in the book. I just copied it and changed it with my data. I think maybe I'm using tibbles instead of data frames, but otherwise it's the same. And all this does is go through this, uh, this simulated you know, fake data thing over and over again, generating new fake data, new draws from the normal distribution, the noise on the, on the fake data, but using the exact same A and B that I did before and fitting it. And then I'm just saving what that fit was in a little array with the with the um, well when we fit saving the um, slopes I mean, just like when they did the text they they concentrate on the slope here not the intercept so i'm saving both the slope and what i got for the standard error from the fit in a little array and then i'm going to say okay let's see if it works is the, is the coverage correct so if the 68 so i should expect to see that 68 percent of the time that i get the values within one standard deviation and 95% of the time I get the values within two standard deviations of the truth, right? That's the B here, right? So this is just, so for example, just to look at this line in a little more detail, make sure it's clear that this calculates for each simulation, I take the measured, uh, the fit slope, B hat, I subtract from it or subtract it from the truth. That's the absolute deviation from the truth. And I compare it to the standard deviation that I fit, uh, that I get from the fit as well. And if that's true, then it's a true, truly in the coverage. If it's not, then it's not in the coverage, right? And so we just run the loop, and sure enough, it looks like it comes out pretty good, right? So 68% coverage, I get 67%. That's, you know, within the, I only did 1,000 of these. And 95% coverage is within, is, I get 94%. So 
everything's working. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise, right? I mean, this, this point of this is just to give us confidence that the fitting procedure is telling the right thing. I don't even know uh, at this point in the book, right? We don't even know what Stan GLM's doing, how it magically comes up with these numbers. So it's good that we do this test, right? I think this is good for any kind of fitting procedure you do. You should do this kind of fake data simulation because it's going to spit back some numbers. Say, oh, here's the here's what I estimate the the slope is, and here's what I estimate the standard deviation of the slope. Well, okay, how do I know that I understand what it means by that? Maybe it says something. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. and how do I know for sure that it's really that it's really doing that for my particular data case? Or maybe there's something weird going on. So, it's, I think this is a very useful skill to have to do this kind of fake data thing. Or good, it's not a skill; it's more of a good practice. Yeah, that's actually pretty slick. I like the um, so basically like the whole um, absolute thing is like you, for each row you're saying compare the difference between the actual y value and um, the predicted y value, and if it's less than the standard error, it means that it's within the um, the sixty eight. Yeah, not the not the y value, but rather the slopes. But yeah, oh, right. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So that to me is the highlight of this chapter, this uh, cool little, you know, drilling down deep into what regression is doing without, without, I mean, treating it as a black box and just and, and mm -hmm. drilling down that way, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And then the last section of the book, um, wow, we're, I'm going really fast. Well, it's a short chapter. It's a short chapter. So yeah. Uh, the last part talks about how we can use uh, regressions to do comparisons. In other words, comparisons and even simple averages are just kind of special cases of regression and the key there is to use an indicator variable uh and you guys know about indicator variable, but zero means the it's not in the category one means it is in the category it indicates men membership right <laughs> that's what an mm -hmm. indicator variable is so we first looked at the how the mean is just a regression on a constant term this seems relatively obvious to me but uh the only interesting thing here is to get an exact match with the mean, he had to. Um, so we're just doing. Where is it? At? Here it is. We're just doing a fit, right? So he generates some fake data. I'm sorry, start this over. Generate some fake data. Again, fake data is our main tool to understand things. Uh, fake data of normally distributed data with a mean of two and a standard deviation of five, and we can just calculate directly the mean and standard error, right? Because that's, you know, that's well known procedure, right? And we get this. Uh, Wait, why is that not two? Something weird about that, isn't there? Hmm. What? Why is this not two? Why is it 0 0.17? I must have changed something. That's weird, isn't it? Huh. Well, I'll, I'll have to fix that. It should have basically come up the same, but let's ignore this line of code here, which I must have changed and not rerun the code or something. But the point yeah. is that whenever, whatever I had in there before, the mean was 0. 0.7 and the standard error is 1.2, right? Okay. And when I, but he's saying, oh, I can do this a different way. I can just use uh, Stan GLM and fit this, you know, to a constant intercept with no slope, right? That's the same thing as calculating the mean. But there's one little gotcha there, and that Stan GLM does have some weekly informative priors and so he specifically now is going to and this is something he said we'll understand later but in the book he just says i'm just, he just puts all these intercepts to be null which i guess is the same thing as saying constant and in that case you basically are going to just get the same thing as the mean 0 0.7 and then 1.2 I, I should spit more digits out so you can see they really are going to be the exact same numbers but um yeah so anyway that's that's that idea right uh, just for fun, I did just take out that part, uh, take out those, just do the default priors. It still is not so bad, right? 0 0.8, still 1.2. Uh, it pushes the mean a little bit to 0 0.8 for some reason, but I was just curious what happened if I didn't put the didn't put the flat priors in and just let it use the uh, default priors. Seems like it comes out close enough as it were <laughs> within, you know, given the standard error, right? And then finally, he talks about uh, how estimating the difference can be seen as regressing on an indicator variable. 
uh, so again, we're going to add some, uh, this is probably where we're thinking, anyway, he's going to add some more, add a new group, okay, call it Y1 with the normal distribution uh, centered at 8 with a standard deviation of 5, and where's Y is equal to 0? What? Yeah, there's no, uh, there's no, where are you defining Y underscore 0? That was in the previous Thing. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. See, I think that's what happened. I changed this to be two to match what he was doing. I didn't rerun all this, mm. so so this part would work. But yeah, so we're just adding a new group now. We had the other group. We already know about that group. That's a new group now with mean eight, scene deviation five again. And the, the the standard way to calculate the difference, which he showed us in a previous chapter, is you take the difference of the means, right? Is your difference, and then you calculate the standard error on the difference by adding the two uh, standard deviations in quadrature, standard errors in quadrature like this, right? Standard error squared, mm -hmm. blah, blah, right? And you get that the difference is a nine plus or minus two. I see, I really need to fix this code. This is messed up. This should be six, but anyway. Mm. Should be six. The true difference is six. We, we put that in by hand, but uh, somehow I messed that up somewhere. I, sh I guess we have time that I can try to All right. run that code. But it, no, it should have re-ran when it knitted, so I'm confused. I'll debug it later. It's not important. The uh, all he was the point is that he's saying that we could do this as a as a uh, we'd set up a as a regression by just shoving all the points together in one big array. Except that I'm going to change the predictor to be um, zeros for the group the first group and ones for the second group. That's my indicator variable which group you're in, right? So this there's like n zero y zeros and there's n one y ones in the Y uh, column, and then in the X column, I just have zeros for all the ones in group one and ones for all the ones in group two. I mean, this is very straightforward. Um, and then you just do a fit to that as if it was a categorical predictor. And again, shoving all the um, flat intercepts in there, you get supposedly the same difference. Actually, it is the same as what I have here. It's just not six like it should be. <laughs> it's the same nine. So somehow I changed something in it. I don't know what's going on. I have to debug that. I even here I say the indicator slope is six, which is not though. So that was weird. Something went weird. Hmm. I mean, this plot is six. Oh, that's because I specifically did this that way. But anyway, this is like a way of look a way of plotting it. This just reproduce what's in the book. It's not that informative. It just there's the, here's all the variables with x. Here's all the variables. Or sorry, x equals zero. Here's all the variables with x equals one. The, the second group and the first group, and this is the line that is the regression line through them. And uh, so it's basically saying that I mean, if you look at it like this, it's just say okay, what's y? Well, if x equals zero, then we're talking about the first group, right? Then y has a, a mean of one point nine. Um, right, which is what it should be, right? And then here, if X is one, then the Y has a mean of 6.4 plus 1.9, which is about 10, right? Yep. And that's where that dotted line is right there. That's all that's saying. The point of all this is that this kind of fake data simulation is a great tool um, to help us drill in and understand these things, especially in more complicated settings, which we will see as we go on through um, adding more parameters, multiple predictors, adding, um, doing logistic regression, doing other kinds of generalized linear regression as we'll get to yeah, as we move through the book here and get to the more complicated stuff. So he's trying to really drill. I think, I feel like he's just trying to make sure that we, we have such super familiarity with this that when he starts making it more complicated, we are we're on solid ground, so to speak, right? That's yeah. my opinion of this. I mean, this is all stuff I have seen before, maybe not with this particular Stan GLM way of doing it, but Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward stuff, I think, anyway. Yeah. Um, I did look a little bit at the exercises. Um, hang on a minute, let me just. And I, I thought there was one that might be interesting just to look at real quick since we have a minute, if I can find it. Oh, did anyone have any questions about this? I mean, that, that's my take on the chapter. I thought it was pretty straightforward and kind of fun to do the uh, fake data. Yeah, I, um, I thought it was interesting. I guess um, 
Yeah, it's a very different way of doing linear regression from what many of us are used to, obviously. I mean, you know, compared to, you know, doing all the Bayesian stuff, I mean. Right. It's cool. Let me see if I have something. Yeah. And like just using the fake data to check is, mm -hmm. as you said, a good way to just be able to check. Yeah, how plausible your results are. I think that's one of the things that most like sort of when you talk about p hacking and like you know questionable research procedures. I think the 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 thing that yeah. you think what this addresses is like you know how plausible is your results given the simulations. You know what I mean? Like exactly. Yeah, it's so easy for you to like you know in an underpowered study to do like some kind of like interaction or some kind of like really small effect type of a thing and then be like. Oh yeah, it's significant, but you know, with this, you can kind of go back and say, well, after we simulated it, it's, it's you know, we didn't get very likely, you know, yeah. estimates. So, I think that's the main thing about doing the this is I think it gives you more of a a broader piece to the um, you know just the inference. You know, it's like we're just so used to saying, oh well, it's significant, good. That's a good point. It reminds me, like when I was in graduate school, uh, doing my physics degree, I the experiment I was doing was looking at scattering of atoms on other atoms, and I was looking for really small, really small signals. Mm -hmm. And I saw something. I mean, I saw a pattern. And it looked like you know, here it is, but it was really noisy, right? Mm -hmm. And I fit the data, and it seemed to you know, match what the model would say, but there's actually a lot of freedom in, in the model at that time that was known about the mm -hmm. like, for cesium scattering. And there's, there's some, uh, you know, unknowns because cesium is much more complicated atom than let's say hydrogen, which we can solve, right? So mm -hmm. and the point of all this was that I wasn't sure, why, was I really looking at a real signal? Was I really looking at noise? So to convince myself, I did this kind of fake data thing, which I thought I was, I was being brilliant, inventing this for myself. But I basically went through and said, well, let's just simulate the whole experiment as yeah. best I can, take into account shot noise and every other piece of noise I can see. And lo and behold, um, I came up with plots that look just like this stuff, stuff, stuff that's coming yeah. out of my experiment. I was like super happy about that. It really gave me more confidence in the whole procedure. And now we're talking about a big procedure. Um, it yeah. gave me confidence in what I was doing. That's cool. I, yeah. So ever since then, I've always been a big supporter of this kind of idea. Yeah. It looks like next up is, um, oops. I don't know what's that on there. What am I looking for here? So next up, Alma is going to look at fitting regression model chapter. And I actually have not looked at this chapter. I'm not even sure what that entails. It, he's other than what he said about it, like, oh, we're coming up. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then the next chapter, prediction and Bayesian inf inference, right? It's going to definitely go into that more and more detail. So now we're going to start really drilling into the mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Oh, yeah, I see. So he's going to start with this, the classic least squared and throw some formulas at us yeah okay yeah yeah, Good stuff. yeah this... actually chapter eight's pretty short too so that'd be uh this, that'd be nice because i have a whole lot of time the next week so <laughs> yeah let's see it's chapter nine gonna be the, the killer one um, I don't have my nah it's not bad either nope it's cool yeah, so like, yeah, we're trying to figure out like, what is it that they're, we're doing in, oh, so we're talking about least squares and maximum likelihood. Okay, I mean, so basically it's just like- Classical kind of- Getting into more of like what you did. Yeah. Just explaining more of like under the hood, like MLE versus least squares or something like that. That's cool. In chapter, you're doing chapter nine, right? Yep. right? So that's gonna be good for you to do because you have the Bayes rule still fresh in your head. So that seems to be like, going to be sort of some of that, revisiting <laughs> yeah. some of that same ground yeah for <laughs> yeah. sure awesome all right well i don't actually don't have anything else so i guess we're going to get out of class early as, say, right? as, as people in the business world say oh, i'll give you this this, this this time back that's what they yeah, give you this time back for free <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate yeah, you guys being I, here though or like 
teachers would say, this is the time for you to do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys got the next 30 minutes to do some exercises for this chapter. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. I did look at the exercises. I did one of them, but now I just looked at what I did. It's all pretty straightforward and not that interesting. I looked at the one where it's like a nonlinear fit, and you know, not nonlinear fit, but nonlinear fake data, and you do a linear fit, and what can you say about it type thing. So I, I recommend it, but I don't think there's no, I don't have any real comments about it. Yeah. It's cool, man. All right. Next week. <laughs>